from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. As soon as I started putting it in the hands of America's last World War II veterans, I had no idea the doors it would open, the stories it would tell, and the legacies it would carry on. And putting that rifle into their hands just really acted as a microphone. Um, they remembered all the memories, and I was able to, to pull out some of stories never heard before. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's Andrew Biggio. He's the author of The Rifle 2, Back to the Battlefield, with more stories from the veterans of World War II. We'll talk with Andrew about the book coming up a little bit later on in today's program. First, we're joined by Dr. Paul Ray, Professor of History, and Charles O. Lee and Louise K. Lee, Chair in Western Heritage at Hillsdale College. His new book is out now, Sparta's Sicilian Proxy War, The Grand Strategy of Classical Sparta, 418 through 413 B.C. Dr. Ray, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you again. People who go way back with our show know we've talked to you about a couple of previous books in this series. This is the fifth in the series just released. So quickly set the stage for us, if you could, as we begin. What's the context of this conflict? Where are we? And who are the major players involved? Okay, well, the title of the book is Sparta's Sicilian Proxy War. Proxy wars take place when you get enduring strategic rivalries. And within my experience as a historian thinking about this, there are two contexts when this happens. One is when you get a war between a land power and a sea power, and neither one can deliver a knockout blow to the other. Mm-hmm. So the thing just goes on and on, and, and they, they're episodes of fighting. They get exhausted and so forth. Uh, the other one is, is the nuclear stalemate. So we live in a world of proxy wars from a Russian perspective, Korea. Vietnam were proxy wars against the United States. They could bleed us cheaply. Mm. All they had to do is provide money and material. We fought a proxy war against the Russians in Afghanistan, providing stingers and so forth to support the Afghan rebels. And it brought down the Soviet Union, arguably. We got paid back when we went into Afghanistan <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the uh, Pakistanis conducting a proxy war against us. And Iran and Syria did the same thing in Iraq. And of course, we're now involved in a proxy war against the Russians in Ukraine. This enduring strategic rivalry between Athens and Sparta begins in about 465, and it lasts all the way down to 404 BC. And the, uh, what I call Sparta-Sicilian proxy war is an incident in that larger struggle. And it, it, the struggle has changed character prior to Sparta's involvement in Sicily. The Athenians managed to put together a coalition, and the key figure doing it is Alcibiades, within the Peloponnesus against Sparta. And for the first time, uh, the, the wars with Athens had become an existential question for the Spartans. That is to say, if they had lost the Battle of Mantinea, in 418 against the Argives and the Mantineans and the Athenians. And they might well have because there were more Athenians on the way Mm -hmm. and there were Elians on the way. Had they lost that battle, they probably would have lost everything. Dr. Ray, where does this fit in Sparta's war strategy? Do they have any aims or additional motives beyond just countering their geopolitical rival here? They've been very reluctant in their war with the Athenians up to this time, because the Athenians stand between them and Persia. This is not a bipolar world, it's a tripolar (laughs) world. And the Persians are off stage, but they're a great threat. And the power that keeps them off stage is Athens with its navy. So there are many at Sparta who do not want to destroy Athens and its navy, on the other hand, they don't want Athens and uh, its its empire to impinge on their domain within the Peloponnesus. Mm-hmm. So that after 418, they suddenly realize they have to really get serious about this, and the Athenians hand them a great favor. They wade into a war 
to conquer all of Sicily. Now, Athens is about 2,000 square miles. Sicily is 10,000 square miles. The largest city in Sicily is Syracuse, and that's uh, where the Athenians start. And Syracuse is as wealthy as Athens, arguably. It has a population that is close to that of Athens, especially after the Athenians had been reduced by the plague. So it, it, it's a major undertaking, and it's 800 nautical miles away from Athens, which in antiquity um, is a very great distance mm -hmm. overseas that, are, that can be very, very rough in the winter. And what happens is there are quarrels at Athens, and the mind behind the Sicilian expedition, a man named Alcibiades, is driven into exile. He persuades the Spartans to intervene. And their intervention consists of sending one man, a man named Gallippus, to Syracuse. And he manages, he arrives at a time when they're about to surrender, and within a matter of weeks, he turns the thing around. <laughs> And the Athenians go in the course of that year, which is, is uh, 415, from the besiegers to the besieged. And they foolishly send a second expedition. They double down on it. Basically, they commit everything they have to it. And thanks to Gallippus and to the steel he has put into the Syracusans, and to some help they get from the Corinthians, which was their mother city, they not only beat the Athenians, they annihilate the Athenian army and destroy the navy that went out. Hmm. So at the end, where does that leave us? What are the current situations of these tri-powers? At the end of the Sicilian expedition, to which Thucydides devotes two books of his history, which is 20% of the history. Um, that's even more. It's a quarter of the history. So those two years, he spends a lot more time on than on any other period. And, and it's because Athens is suddenly made vulnerable to Sparta because of this. It doesn't mean the Athenians will lose, mm -hmm. but it does tempt the Persians to enter the fray and the Spartans to make an alliance with Persia, which they'd been very loath to do in the past, because they think they have to get rid of the Athenians, and the only way to do it is to use Persian money to produce the fleets and to pay the people who row in the fleets. So it's it's of profound importance for the outcome of the war because it opens up the possibility of defeating Athens. A and look... It, the expedition was something crazy. The Athenians didn't need to do it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that much to gain. Had they been victorious, they would have had a great deal of trouble holding on to what they had conquered. It's a long ways away. They, they don't have the manpower to have a garrison sure. that can really hold it. So it's, 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 it, it's a, a foolish and arrogant endeavor. The ancient Spartan regime is renowned for fierce and courageous warriors, but less renowned for their displays of strategy. So how does the book Spartans Sicilian Proxy War help to perhaps alter the characterization and bring a greater appreciation of the military prowess of the Spartan regime? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, our image of Sparta is Thermopylae, a tremendous bravery fighting to the death. That, in, in fact, was the way the Greeks saw them, too. But the truth of the matter is the Spartans are cunning and clever. Uh, I'll give you two examples. The Battle of Plataea. This is the decisive battle of the Persian Wars. The Athenians, with the Spartan allies, have defeated the Persians at Salamis, but there is a Spartan, there is a Persian army still in Greece, perfectly capable of conquering it if they had won the Battle of Plataea. And what do the Spartans do? They outwit the Persians. Hmm. The strength of Persia is, is mainly in cavalry. The Persians understand that. They have withdrawn to Boeotia, where there's a plain. The Spartans do not fight them in that plain. What they do is they pretend panic. 
they pretend a kind of, of, of um, dispute within their own ranks, and they withdrew, withdraw in apparent disorder to high ground on the outskirts of Mount Kithiron, which separates Attica from Boeotia, and they draw the Persians to attacking them on terrain where the Persians cannot deploy their cavalry. So the Persians are left with their artillery, which is to say their, their archers, uh, and with their, their infantrymen. Okay, their infantrymen are inferior to those of the Greeks. The equipment that they have is not very good. And the bulk of their infantrymen double as archers. Hmm. So they'll drop their bows, they'll pick up uh, uh, shields, and they'll pick up spears, and they'll attack. The Greeks have a kind of armor that, that, that Persian archers can't penetrate. Now, you get unlucky, they'll hit you in the eye. <laughs> or they'll hit you in the neck. But basically, the Greeks can hunker down and and live through an artillery barrage. And then they can attack. And if the Persians do not have the support of their cavalry, they can slaughter. That's what the Athenians did at Marathon. They outwitted the Persians at Marathon, and they won. The Spartans do the same thing at Plataea. So the notion that the Spartans don't really... Uh, understand warfare is simply pa- false. And look, Gallippus arrives at Syracuse, sizes up the situation, and within a week, the tide has turned because he sees where the Athenians are vulnerable and he uses an army of Syracusans, and they outnumber the Athenians, to sort of hold the Athenian army in place. And then he sends another force secretly around behind them to take their principal fort. And this buoys up the the spirits of the Syracusans. And then they have to move to prevent the Athenians from building a wall around Syracuse on the land side. Dr. Ray, what are the potential consequences of that? What can we say about the Syracusans and their way of life? One, uh, they don't import grain. Hmm. So besieging them from the sea alone is useless. You've got to do it from both the sea and the land. And the Athenian strategy is a standard strategy is is to build a wall around their wall and wall them in and starve them out. And they're most of the way there when he arrives. Now, how do you how do you deal with that? A counter wall. And to sustain the effort in building a counter wall, you've got to defeat them on the ground. Hoplite tactics. Well, he trains the Syracusans, he turns them into Spartans in fairly short order. They win that, and then move after move, there will be diversionary tactics, and then he'll strike. Diversionary tactics, and then he'll strike. And every victory over the Athenians that takes place takes place because he gets them to concentrate in the wrong place. Hmm. Uh, In other words, the Athenians who are proud of their intelligence get outwitted by the Spartan. And, and the, the, you know, the, there's a, there's a, it, it eventually goes to sea inside the harbor at Syracuse, which is huge. I went down there. It's a, just immense. So you can actually have a major naval battle hmm. in a harbor. Can't maneuver very well, but you can get all the ships in there. The, the way they win that is by trying to figure out when the Athenians eat. Get their people organized for having lunch. And then you attack. And by the way, this, this, this happens two more times later in the war. And the Battle of Aegospotomy, that's, that's how Lysander has his final victory over the Athenians. So the Spartans have generals who can think and who can figure out the defects of the other side and outwit them. They're extremely good at this. And, and in, the, in the secondary literature, they're simply underestimated. Mm-hmm. Nobody's really written about this. I've thought about writing just an article called Outwitting the Enemy, the Lacedaemonian Secret. This would just drive people crazy because it, <laughs> it, 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 it's contrary to all of the prejudices of everyone in the classics profession and right. in the larger world. 
of the defining events in the Peloponnesian War, where does the Sicilian expedition fit? How does it compare to others? And is it perhaps one of the most decisive events of the entire conflict? It is. I don't think there's any doubt. Look, if you're looking at the first stage in the war, what, what uh, the Greeks called the Arcadamian War, uh, it's a stalemate. And they, they fight to exhaustion. Then there's a brief moment where things fall apart in the Peloponnesus. Alcibiades takes advantage of it, and you get the Battle of Mantinea. That might have been decisive, but it wasn't. And so you've got a stalemate in the war. How do you break the stalemate? Well, what Sicily does is it deprives the Athenians of manpower and of ships. Ships are expensive to build. They take time to build. Manning them is expensive. So in a certain sense, what the Spartans deprived the Athenians of is their principal advantage, which was money. Mm -hmm. And it's this that causes the Persians to think, we can finally get rid of these Athenians. And they, they send people with money to the Spartans saying, we can help. And the Battle of Mantinea has persuaded the Spartans that they really need to make an alliance with Persia, which they have been very loath to do prior to that time. So you get that alliance. And then the allies of the Athenians resent, especially the larger cities, having to pay the tribute. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to get them to rebel. Mm -hmm. And so the Athenians suddenly find themselves desperate for money. And after the Sicilian expedition, if the Athenians lose a single major battle, it's over. They cannot afford to lose a single battle. The Spartans can lose battle after battle and still come back because the Persians will give them the money to build the ships. Uh, and that's essentially what happens. Now, could the Athenians have uh, won through? Could they have survived this? Yes. Because there are a couple times when the Spartans lose heart and sue for peace. And certainly the second of the two times would have left the Athenians in a pretty good position. And they were very foolish to reject the peace offer at that time. Uh, especially since the, the uh, and, and the terms are that everybody keeps what they've got. Well, the Athenians had what they absolutely had to have. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spartans they wouldn't keep what they had because they don't treat their allies very well, but also they're reluctant to be out there in the first place. They're mm -hmm. land lovers. They, 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 they have a servile population back in the Peloponnesus to keep down. They're very nervous going far afield. And a sustained effort far afield is not going to happen. So if the Athenians had been willing to be patient accept the peace, and wait for things to drop into their laps, they'd have not only won through, they'd have been back where they were. But patience is not an Athenian quality. The people who won at Marathon didn't win by patience. The people who won at Salamis didn't win by patience. They won by audacity. Um, so it, it's, they've been, the character of the people has been shaped by their history, and they're really incapable <laughs> of being cunning through diplomacy. Is that the key tactical mistake on behalf of the Athenians, the rejection of that peace I agreement? think so, yes. You know, it laid in the war. It, it's after the Battle of Arganusai. The Athenians have won the battle, but it wasn't a decisive victory. The Spartans lose heart. And at that point, Athens depends upon grain imported from Crimea, <laughs> just like much of the world today. Uh, the road to Crimea through the Hellespont, through the Sea of Marmara, through the Bosporus to the Black Sea is entirely in their hands at this time. So what they really need, they have. And what would be required for them to win through is patience. Now, the irony is, the, the people who are patient are the Spartans. They wait, they watch, they take advantage of mistakes. And by the way, that's what their generals do. Mm -hmm. 
they take their time. They're not in a hurry. The Athenians are always in a hurry. <laughs> Dr. Paul Ray, the new book, the fifth in his series, Sparta's Sicilian Proxy War, The Grand Strategy of Classical Sparta, 418 to 413 BC. That book is available now. Dr. Ray, Professor of History, Charles O. Lee and Louise K. Lee Chair in Western Heritage here at Hillsdale College. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. It's been good to be with you again. Up next, Andrew Biggio is with us. His new book, The Rifle 2, Back to the Battlefield Stories from World War II. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Would you turn down millions of dollars per year? All you'd have to do is surrender your independence and abandon your principles for the money. That's a devil's bargain. Sadly, it's one that almost all American colleges and universities make. But one college in America says, no, our college, Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College refuses to accept one penny of taxpayer money, not even indirectly in the form of federal student grants and loans. By saying no to taxpayer money, we remain genuinely independent, free to pursue our original 1844 mission, pursuing truth and defending liberty. Hillsdale has over 1,500 undergraduate and graduate students on its main campus in Michigan and its satellite campus in Washington, D.C., in addition, over 3 million citizens have enrolled in our free online courses, and over 6 million American households receive our free monthly publication, Imprimus, delivered in the mail. You can learn more about Hillsdale's independence from government, its mission of defending liberty, and its national educational outreach programs at hillsdale.edu penny. That's hillsdale.edu penny. Or, if it's more convenient, Text the word PENNY to 7 and we'll send you a link with more information on Hillsdale's independence. That's PENNY to 7 We're back on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. It's at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Find older episodes of this program, plus many other fine Hillsdale College shows. We're joined now by Andrew Biggio. He's formerly served as a United States Marine Corps Infantry Sergeant, currently on the police force in Boston, Massachusetts, a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, president of New England's Wounded Veterans, Inc. He's also the author of a couple of books, including this new one, The Rifle Two: Back to the Battlefield. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We have to talk about the rifle first, I think, especially if people did not read or have not seen the first book in this series. Tell us about the rifle that is on the cover of this book and the rifle that helped uh, inspire so many of the stories inside. Sure. The rifle, uh, which is now becoming famously known around the world, is a rifle that I possess that has over 320 signatures covering it of all of the different World War II veterans I've met and interviewed and um, this particular rifle started off with no signatures. It started off as a basic wooden stock rifle. And as soon as I started putting it in the hands of America's last World War II veterans, I had no idea um, the doors it would open, the stories it would tell, and the legacies it would carry on. And putting that rifle into their hands just really acted as a microphone. Um, they remembered all the memories of specific battles they were in, training they did. I mean, we're going back 78 years, and it was just such a good bonding technique from veteran to veteran. And I was able to to pull out some of stories never heard before. What is it, do you think, about the service rifle that makes it so uniquely capable of unlocking the memories from these veterans? You know, it's because you had to survive with that piece of equipment. It was the most important piece of your equipment to have was a Marine and his rifle, a soldier and his weapon. Um, that was what General Patton called the weapon that won the war. And without it, you were useless. The rifle without you, you were useless. You know, everybody, I think, understands that, especially those who have served. I mean, this is 
the only thing standing between you and tyranny, you and Nazism, and uh, these men ate, slept, and and lived with this rifle in foxholes for years. You tell a story at the beginning of the book, it might be just the the introduction itself, about why there is a, a book two, and what prompted you to begin this journey once again to find these World War II veterans. Why is there a, a, a sequel here to the rifle? Well, I guess I realized um, in many ways that this was very therapeutic as a young veteran who went through stresses of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And now I'm a police officer experiencing um, daily reminders of tragedies sitting in front of a World War II veteran who had lived through the Battle of Normandy, storming the beaches on D-Day, the flat, you know, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, prisoners of war, um, B-17 pilots. These guys went through such trauma and tragedies, and they were able to live a successful life after combat. And so <clears throat> really I wanted all these younger veterans and even just civilians and supporters who might think they have a uh, life rough to see the stories of these men that we call the greatest generation, what they were able to overcome, have careers, have families, go to college and live until almost a hundred years old. I, I just, I hope it's a good um, guidance pe- for people for life. This project and these books are really about collecting the stories of the World War II generation, those who fought in World War II, honoring that place that they have in American history. Why, for you, is it so important to get these stories? And what will be lost once we are unable to collect any more of these stories? It's, yeah, I mean, we are in the single digits left of American World War II veterans. Single digit years, I mean, you know, uh, I think in five years, the youngest World War II veterans will be about 102. And we're going to lose so much firsthand accounts. Now it's from here on in, it's going to be just reading books that someone else wrote or stories that someone else heard. And I've been able to deliver to America's youth via social media. You know, I have like 80,000 followers on Instagram. So these kids are able to take their phone out of their pocket and see these photos and see these interviews of America's World War II veterans, stuff they're not getting in school. So that's one good thing social media has been doing with raising awareness of America's last World War II veterans. Now you can see on the news and on internet news clippings of a a World War II veteran celebrating his 100th birthday. You know, this is stuff that we didn't do for the World War I veterans who disappeared before our eyes. Talking with Andrew Biggio, his book is The Rifle II, Back to the Battlefield. These stories themselves are, I'll I'll say, better read from the people themselves. And so I don't want to ask you too much to tell other people's stories. That's what the book is for. But there are a few I wanted to dig into in our in our conversation today. You talked in the book with Jake Rooser, 98 years old, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, saved hundreds of lives with the 4th Infantry Division during World War II. What was it like to talk to someone who was in the business of saving lives during World War II? Jake is such a humble man. I mean, this this guy, his father was in World War One. His father was a Purple Heart recipient. He became a World War II veteran. He became a Purple Heart recipient. And just a humble man. I mean, listening to the stories, particularly about the Battle of the Hurricane Forest with him. I mean, going up and down these hills. I mean, it was the most per capita wounded American soldiers in, in a battle condensed in the forest there in the Hurricane Forest. And he had to drag these men up and down these gullies, these ravines back to safety with artillery exploding all around him. And, you know, I took him back to this location. I took him back to Germany and the, the forest is full of trees. And he's like, the last time I was here, there was no trees. They were all exploded. They were burst in half. And now to see that there's an actual forest here is just amazing. And I surprised, you know, the reason why the book's called Back to the Battlefield, because this particular book, I brought about 10 veterans back to their foxholes, to their the homes they took refuge in. And so I surprised Jake with a plaque that said, dedicated to the medics of the 4th Infantry Division in the Battle of the Hurkin Forest. This plaque was dedicated by Jake Ruser, who returned 78 years later. One of the veterans on the trip was a guy named Melvin B. Harris. And his chapter in the book is A Case of Stolen Valor. And you tell the story about what he told you 
what you found out was true about what he told you and how you handled that situation. Tell us a little bit about the story of Melvin B. Harris, and I guess, why do you think someone would tell a story like that that is simply not true? Yeah, so stolen valor is no new phenomenon. It's been going on since probably wars have begun. You know, everybody wants to be a hero. Everybody wants to uh, pretend that they were brave or had a job that didn't involve, uh, you know, scraping potatoes or, uh, you know, uh, working in supply. Everybody wanted to be that infantry marine, that sniper, that Medal of Honor recipient deep down inside, I think. And Melvin was one of those people, Melvin, whose name I had to change because I didn't want to embarrass him or his family. Right. He since passed away. And, but man, he got me good. And I think a lot of researchers, historians, and authors have also, everyone's been kind of punked by a veteran who said they did X, Y, and Z, but then we find out they didn't. And it's because, you know, his part of coping, his part of therapy was lying, was making himself out to be a different kind of soldier and a different kind of hero in life. And that is what he did to get past his trauma is not just of what happened to him in the military, but what happened to him as a child, his childhood. And after learning, you know, I was so mad when he lied to me and I found out he wasn't in D-Day and he didn't jump in with the 101st Airborne. But when I look back at his early life and his life after the military service, I understand why he wanted to be a hero in his own mind, and I accepted it. And when we got back from Europe, and I found out he was a liar, you know, I brought him back to his house and saw the way, the conditions he was living in, and he looked at me and he said, "Uh, you're like the grandson I never had, thank you. And just the fact that I was able to put a smile on his face when 50% of his life was terrible, um, I forgave him. And, you know, I, I say at the end of the chapter, you know, he may have been a liar, but he was my liar. <laughs> and I also wanted to ask about Charles Ketchum. This, this, this gun, the rifle, brings back so many memories for so many veterans of World War II. As they hold it, as they touch it, Charles Ketchum didn't want to hold it, didn't want to touch it, didn't want to look at it. His chapter is called The Pacifist. What did you make of Charles Ketchum? It was good to, to meet someone like Charles um, because the, Unlike Stolen Valor, you can tell this guy went through something. You know, the fact that he vowed to never pick up a rifle again. He didn't want to hold it. You know, he had he signed it for me and he took part in my project and let me hear his story. But he, he didn't want to hold it. And I respected that so much. And to hear his story about fighting in Germany, he's somebody that was a replacement, you know. And we always, we always focus on these battles and the Battle of the Bulge and Normandy. But... We really forget how bad the fighting was after our troops crossed the Rhine River and had to do that house-to-house fighting and uh, dealing with a fanatical enemy that didn't want to necessarily always surrender in some of these German towns. And he was someone that had to kill. He had to kill, and I think that stuck with him for life. He never went to any reunions. He never took part in any Veterans Day, Memorial Day stuff, and uh, I'm glad I got to... uh, cover a little bit about his story. And um, I am sad because he did pass away before he saw the finished product. I've asked you about a few of these veterans I found interesting. Is there anything or anyone in particular that you hold uh, as a special place in your heart or a story that sticks with you to this day? Boy, a lot of them. But I I think Ed, Ed, who's particularly Ed Cottrell, who is in book two, um, he flew 65 missions as a P-47 pilot at age 22 years old. And I took him back to his runway for the first time since World War II. We found his overgrown runway in Belgium. And then we took it a little step further. We went into Germany and located two different crash sites of his roommates. His own. He lost two roommates in the Battle of the Bulge. They were shot down by flak. They were shot down by enemy planes and to be there with him at the crash crash sites of his friends. And we contacted the farmers who own the property and the farmers said, well, hell for the last 30 years, my tractor has been kicking up pieces of this plane. And we were able to give pieces of this plane to Ed of his roommate, his wingman, Ted Smith's plane. Ed got to bring home with him back to North Carolina at age a hundred. And that was just powerful. 
Veterans in other nations like Switzerland can, can take their service rifles home with them when their time in the military is up. Based on what you've witnessed through these interviews, do you think that a, that a similar policy here in the U.S. where soldiers got to keep their service weapons would be beneficial psychologically to American veterans? Not necessarily. Um, I like the fact that the next young veteran that goes to boot camp or basic training can hold the rifle that another veteran or soldier used before him and to know that that weapon took care of the soldier before him and that weapon had history and I think that is probably more psychologically sound than bringing home a weapon and probably (laughs) financially better for the government I guess but um yeah I mean I like the fact that I could look down at my rifle and see like initials and little tape markings of the the marine that held it before me Andrew Biggio, his book, The Rifle 2, Back to the Battlefield, is available now. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you for having me. Up next, we talk with Courtney Mayette from Hillsdale's chemistry department. Last time we checked in, she was doing Ironman races, now something else, but equally athletic. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. As a Hillsdale podcast listener, you know that our great nation was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. But far too many of our nation's colleges and universities, including those in the Ivy League, insist on using race as a factor for admissions. The Supreme Court recently decided a case on this very subject. But there's a unique American college that doesn't discriminate based on race. It never has and never will. It's us. Hillsdale College. Hillsdale was founded in 1844 to educate all persons, irrespective of nationality, color, or sex. We continue that policy today, admitting students on the strength of their character, ability, and intentions, not their heritage or background. Larry P. Arne, Hillsdale's president, had an article published in the Wall Street Journal explaining the college's colorblind policies and its related refusal of government funding, even indirectly in the form of federal student aid. You can read it for yourself at hillsdale.edu slash equal. And after you read it, you may even want to support us with a tax-deductible gift. So please read Dr. Arn's article at hillsdale.edu slash equal. You also can text equal to 7 right now for a link to the free article. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Find out if there's a radio station in your area playing this program. Go to radiohour.hillsdale.edu and click on our affiliates link. We're joined by Dr. Courtney Mayette. She is chairwoman and associate professor of chemistry here at Hillsdale College. Dr. Mayette, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We last talked by this point a couple of years ago, which seems hard to believe. <laughs> But you were you were in the middle of the world of Ironman competitions, which seems tough enough. D- did you enjoy those events? And what did you take away from that experience? I I did enjoy the events. Um, it, you know, it, it started off as a little small uh, sprint triathlon, and it snowballed into an Olympic distance, then a uh, 70.3, and then finally the 140.6, because everyone <laughs> has to do an Ironman in their lifetime. Uh, and I didn't stop there. I did a second Ironman. But it's a lot of work. It's uh, a lot of training, several hours, you know, upwards of 20 hours a week of training. And uh, it's it's multidiscipline, you know, the swim, bike, run. And it just it's hard to juggle all of that. Yeah. And I honestly, I I liked biking more than the other, you know, two disciplines. And I found that I was going to these events because I lived to be on the bike. Mm -hmm. And so you've transitioned, in fact, over to the world of from Ironman to gravel racing. So yes. How did you find out about gravel racing and what about it appealed to you? Okay, it's it's a little bit of a long story, but I was thinking about going strictly into cycling. I'd done some ultra cycling events. So I did a I did the national 24-hour time trial where, you know, you get on a bike and you just put in as many miles as you can within 24 hours. And some people think that's fun. Uh, <laughs> and I thought it would be fun until, you know, about midnight 
probably 16, 18 hours in and, and it started to hurt really bad. And I didn't, you know, I was not questioning so my anymore. life choices. Yeah. No, not fun anymore. <laughs> but I had my sights set on doing more cycling. And then I found out that I had actually qualified for USAT nationals. So that's triathlon uh, age group national championships. And I thought, well, that's a that's kind of a neat thing. Maybe I should train for that. And I didn't know how to train for both. So I hired a coach. And through knowing this coach and him knowing what I liked, he suggested I get into gravel cycling. And so that's really where you know, where I got into gravel. So what are the details? What's what's different about gravel cycling than other cycling? What, what, what makes it a challenge? Yeah, so, so interesting about gravel cycling, you know, a lot of people will say, well, people have been riding on gravel roads f- since they've had bicycles, you know, because we didn't have pavement mm-hmm. uh, back in the uh, early days of the bicycle. And so gravel cycling as a discipline, though, has become, um, it's probably the most recent uh, cycling discipline, and it's gained a lot of traction in the last few years, especially since COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people, you know, needing something to do, getting their bodies moving, getting on a bike. And so the United States has really been the center of that surge of gravel cycling, and it's spilling over now internationally. And uh, the UCI, which is the governing body of uh, cycling, has now adopted gravel and is having their own gravel events. Um, but it is, it's definitely U.S. based and there's a culture. It's, it's special. Uh, there's road cycling, there's, there's crit racing, there's cyclocross, there's mountain biking. And now we have gravel and uh, gravel is just a different kind of scene. Some people would say there's a spirit of gravel and it's a lot of people that just enjoy getting out and riding their bikes. Uh, there's generally a, a big party scene after. So there's, <laughs> there's good food, there's beer, there's, uh, they'll have live bands. And sometimes I think for many people, it's more about the after party than the actual cycling event. But it's just a good time to get out and be with others uh, and to enjoy a lot of our natural world. You know, our our gravel roads take us off of the main roads Mm -hmm. and get us out into nature. And uh, you see a lot more. Um, It's typically safer than riding on the roads. You you don't have to worry so much about, you know, any kind of vehicle traffic. Uh, It's rare you'll see a car. Um, It just, it allows you to relax more, I think, and enjoy the sport. Where can you do this? Is there some special equipment that you need? (laughs) Well, if you have dirt roads or gravel roads, you can go ride a gravel bike. Uh, you can ride a gravel bike on paved roads too, you know. Uh, but we are super blessed to be in Michigan where we have a lot of gravel. We have more gravel roads in Michigan than we have paved roads. And, you know, pretty much you just go out your, your door and you can hit dirt right away. As far as special equipment, you know, you can't take your average road bike out on the gravel. You got these little tiny tires, you'll slide all over the place. So gravel cycling has um, really developed a huge industry that specializes, I think, primarily in tires. I mean, there there are bike (laughs) frames and there's the gear, but tires is really, it's, it's always the topic of conversation, you know, for pavement, you know, you have a few tires that are really good and everyone knows what kind of tire you need to ride on pavement, but dirt's different. You know, you have rocky dirt, you have smooth dirt, you have clay dirt, you have sandy dirt, you know, so uh, there's a tire for all of those. And that's really where the equipment differs is what kind of tire are you running? You know, what's your PSI? How wide is the tire? That's what everyone talks about in the gravel world. Talking with Dr. Courtney Mayette here at Hillsdale College about gravel cycling. What's your approach, meaning How much of this for you is fun and exercise and how much of this is being competitive as you would be in, say, like the Ironman competitions? Yeah, so I, I'm very competitive. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I like to say that it's, it's purely for pleasure and enjoyment of the outside world, but I really do like to get, uh, get out there and see what I can do and push my body and test my limits. And I mean, that it makes sense. I mean, Iron Man is kind of the same thing. Yeah. And I want to see, you know, what I can do with gravel. Take us through one of those events then. How many people are generally involved? How many end up finishing? And what's it like along the way? Yeah. <laughs> so, we, there are so many different types of gravel events. There are really small gravel events where, you know, you'll be lucky to get 100 people total involved up to uh, some of the large events throughout the United States where these races can draw thousands of people at a time. Um, I would say that, you know, 
pretty much everyone that starts the race will typically finish. There are, I mean, with with the exception of those that have, you know, mechanical issues, there there doesn't seem to be that huge DNF that did not finish right. rate in gravel cycling like there is in Ironman. Typically, everyone that gets on their bike finishes as long as their bike can hold out. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a question. My son and I bike a, a lot, as I mentioned to you off here, and we have had between us, I think, three bikes fail in the midst of mm-hmm. cycling. So it's not out of the question that right. those things can happen. Right. At these races, though, you're not just competing, you're, you're winning. You won first place in the women's 50 mile at the recent third annual Sasquatch Gravel Chase bike race. So how, how do you get good? How do you work to improve? I don't know. I I think I'm a little of an anomaly. I When I did triathlon, you know, it was just, I was middle of the road. I was just, an, I'm just an average person that's trying to get in shape and, and do a race. You know, I, and I, you know, swimming, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I can get through the water. I'm not super fast. <laughs> With running, you know, I can shuffle along after swimming and, and riding my bike, uh, but I'm not a fast runner. And, but I had a good bike split. So I found that I had, for whatever reason, some strong legs underneath me whenever I got on the bike. And that's the whole reason I ended up qualifying for nationals in triathlon was it was solely on bike split, you know, had nothing to do with my swim or my run. <laughs> and so I, I've taken to it naturally. I, and again, I'm, I'm competitive. I do work with a coach. Uh, I have a very structured uh, training plan. I ride on average about six days a week. And those six days are, are broken up into certain types of workouts, you know, interval workouts versus just endurance or recovery rides. I also do a lot of strength training, Mm -hmm. uh, probably about five hours of core and uh, strength training every week. In addition to the cycling I do. You mentioned, you know, training, strength training. Yeah. What about the mental aspect? You know, Ironman, I imagine there's a lot of, you know, can I do this? Can I get through this? Can I make it to the end and not DNF, do not yeah, finish? Yeah. With gravel racing, gravel cycling, you explained at the beginning, you see a lot of places you don't get a chance to see otherwise, mm-hmm. and you see a lot of nature. Mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. it more of a, of a, is there more of a freeing aspect mentally? When you do this? When I race, no. Yeah. I would say there's no. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, honestly, in. when I am in a race, uh, you know, I couldn't tell you what I saw alongside the road. I am so <laughs> fixated on what I'm doing. My mental focus is is all about, you know, where are my power numbers? You know, where is my heart rate? Am I taking on enough hydration? You know, am, am I taking in enough carbohydrates? Am I taking in enough sodium? You know, I'm keeping track of all of these things. And as far as, you know, mental toughness, yeah, you know, sometimes it's awful. You know, sometimes it hurts really bad, especially at the beginning of the race. These races go out <laughs> hard and aggressive and people are shoulder to shoulder and you're just hanging on for dear life, knowing that at some point things are going to settle down hopefully. Um, but yeah, you can go to some dark places and it can be, it can be a little bit daunting. So you really have to shake yourself up and to, you know, focus on the positive and understand that everybody around you is encountering those same feelings. Everybody hurts. Yeah. You just have to push through it and get through. So yeah, it's, it's looking at the the wheel in front of you and, and just, you know, riding hard and having that intense focus. And then afterwards you get to see some, maybe some photographs that were taken <laughs> and you go, oh, wow, that was really pretty. I didn't, you know, wow, I rode, I rode by a, a beautiful barn and, you know, some colorful trees and didn't even realize I was there. What do you know now about gravel? cycling, gravel racing that perhaps you wish you knew when you started? I wish I would have started earlier. I mean, gravel is fairly new, but cycling is not. And my my grandfather was a cyclist, uh, an avid cyclist. He rode his bike across the United States several times from California to Florida. In fact, he, he could do that in a month in wow. the summer. And I was always very inspired by him, and uh, his his love of cycling has definitely been been passed down to me. But it really hasn't been until you know I've become older and I've had the time to devote more towards a hobby that I've been able to really immerse into cycling. So yeah, I wish I wish I would have had it earlier. I, I feel that now, you know, later in life, I. I feel like I've missed out on some experiences, but you know, it's, it's a, 
now it's just a matter of, of moving forward and enjoying what I have in the moment and appreciating it. Dr. Courtney Mayette, Chairwoman and Associate Professor of Chemistry and Competitive Gravel Racer. Dr. Mayette, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Dr. Paul Ray from Hillsdale's History Department, Andrew Biggio, the author of The Rifle Two, and Courtney Mayette from Hillsdale's Chemistry Department. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews, including more stories from Andrew Biggio this week, or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.